in terms of estrogen dominance, it, I feel like it's all over social media. Yeah. Is it a real thing? So I think it's it's a it was probably started out as someone trying to explain oligoovulation and anovulation. So and what those words mean and you know to the lay people is someone who's not ovulating at all or ovulating regularly. Mm -hmm. So we end up with higher estrogen levels and lower or lower zero progesterone levels. We must ovulate to make progesterone in that second half of our cycle. And so if you went in and got that one time blood work, it would look like a higher estrogen or very low progesterone. Okay, so I think in functional medicine world, estrogen dominance was a Band-Aid term that covers PCOS, that covers perimenopause, that covers, you know, hypothalamic suppression. If you're starving, you know, there's multiple reasons we don't ovulate medication, you know, suppression. So there are lots of things that can cause it, but I would never tell a patient she has estrogen dominance. I will tell her, you have insulin resistance, which is leading to your PCOS. You are in perimenopause because you have reached a critical level of your eggs, you you know, you're running out of eggs and your your brain cannot make enough LH and FSH to get you to ovulate regularly because you're becoming resistant because of your egg quality mm -hmm. and supply. So, you know, what your listeners may not understand, like their, their testicles, you know, if they're healthy, are making sperm every day for the rest of their lives. You know, yeah. make it harder as they get older, but they can still do it, most of them. We have a limited egg supply that we are born with and they deteriorate and go away over time and menopause represents no more eggs. Yeah. Therefore, no more function coming from the ovary because we've run out of the supply. So by the time a woman is 30, she's down to about 10% of her egg supply. And by the time she's 40, she's down to about 3%, yeah. which is why fertility is an issue as we get older. Right. Right. Because we, our egg quality decreases and we don't have many, very many left. And so, you know, explaining it to patients like that, they're like, oh, that makes sense. They just, you know, the whole like estrogen dominance thing is like, oh, like there's something wrong with you. I prefer to like, give them the root cause of what's going on. And estrogen dominance in and of itself is a symptom. Right. Not, it's a high estrogen level. It's not a reason or a cause. And it's a temporary high estrogen yes. level. It's not something that's sustained right. over but a period of time. there are those in the functional medicine space who do not understand menopause and perimenopause, especially in the type of providers who can't prescribe hormone therapy. So they want, and they tend to demonize it and try to sell you supplements to fix your hormone imbalances. And so, you know, I take supplements for multiple reasons. I actually sell a few supplements, but, you know, I am not curing menopause with my supplements. And I'm very clear about that. I'm yeah. supporting fiber levels, vitamin D, things that we're now you know we tend to get low in in the menopause transition but you know most supplements will not fix bring your ovaries back to life your hormones yeah right <laughs> they're not bringing your ovaries back to life they can support metabolically some other things that are going on but there is no cure for menopause yet so in the perimenopause period if someone's got symptoms you don't really need to get a blood test in terms of starting hormones mm -hmm. you said estrogen is effective what about because you said estrogen sort of has this fluctuation yeah. and progesterone progesterone tends to can decline. be very effective so yeah. it, it is a very nuanced decision on how what levels do we start at what dose do we give estrogen and progesterone do we get progesterone only you never give estrogen alone if she has a uterus you must give progesterone so if i have a reason i need to so birth control pills and hormonal contraception was developed to stop ovulation mm -hmm. Menopause hormone therapy and the current FDA doses were pretty much developed to support, stop a hot flash. Mm -hmm. So the biggest difference between the two is dose. Okay, now there is formulation differences we tend to use, at least in the in the menopause world, in the menopause, we use estradiol and we're trying to give you back pretty much what your, your ovaries used to make. Yeah. So we're using progesterone, estradiol, and testosterone. We're not using the synthetic derivatives. I love having options. You know, not everything works for everyone, but those are kind of my go-tos, right? Yeah. But... If I need to suppress her ovulation, she still needs contraception, mm -hmm. okay? And her partner won't get a vasectomy. So she- Vasectomies are very safe, guys. Yes, get we love vasectomies. vasectomies. Yes, you get a gold star from Dr. Haver if you've had a vasectomy. And Save me. your wife <laughs> so um, or loved one. So, you know, she needs contraception, has no other option, or she's got really heavy periods or really bad cramps or acne or things with high androgens. Sometimes birth control pills may be that level of dose, the higher dose to suppress her future ovulations is what I'm gonna go with. If she's not having any of that, and she's really having trouble sleeping. I love progesterone, especially in early perimenopause if sleep is her main dysfunction because it's mm -hmm. so good for sleep. It affects that GABA level in the brain and really helps calm us and relax us. You wanna take it before you go to bed. You know, if she's having hot flashes, joint pain, anything that I know estrogen is gonna come in and be the hero, I'm gonna give her that. 
Okay, even if she's peri, when you give low dose estradiol and menopause hormone therapy doses in peri, what we think is that we have very little studies done yet we're getting there. So the brain is always, the hypothalamus in our brain is always sensing in the blood for estrogen. And when it gets low, it sends a signal to the pituitary. So the hypothalamus sends something called GnRH, so gonadotropin releasing hormone to the pituitary and saying, tell the ovaries to get an ovulation going and let's get some estrogen. It's time. Mm-hmm. So the, the pituitary starts pulsatile sending LH and FSH down to the ovary. The ovary has those receptors. And if the ovary still has enough eggs and egg quality, it will respond and ovulate, right? Make the estrogen that month, you get the surge. And then after you ovulate, then progesterone takes over and then the whole thing starts over, okay? And Perry, we're getting the resistance. So giving her just enough estrogen calms the brain down and says, we're okay. And you're going to shore her up. You'll still ovulate. You'll still get a few pulses going, enough for you to ovulate if that's going to happen for you. Not enough to suppress an ovulation, but enough to calm down that wild rocket ride. Mm. You know, when you get more of a steady state than you would have had you just left it to whatever she was doing naturally. That makes sense. You also mentioned some of these symptoms that I thought, like even I was shocked with some of them. But one of them... Oh, in the book? Yeah. yeah. Crawling, feeling under the the skin. skin. Yeah, so... That was actually in 2000, no, it was in the 90s. There was something called the Green Score that was published. And Mm -hmm. it was looking at a scoring symptom of different symptoms and cycles were not in there. It was nothing Mm -hmm. to do with her periods. And what were the severity of the symptoms? It was some genital urinary symptoms, some mental health, but it had this crawling feelings under the skin and it had uh, joint pain, muscle pain, uh, back pain. And you... You rate, so they would rate and give the likelihood that these symptoms were related to perimenopause Mm -hmm. and menopause. It was the first time I'd seen a constellation of symptoms addressed, and it was published as this beautiful scoring system in 2008. I'd never seen it till I was digging around researching for the book. And I was like, somebody's figured this out, you know, like, and the Australasian Menopause Society had published it and were using it on their website. So I kind of adapted it, you know, for the US and like put it on my website. And that's how I was screening patients. And so then I dug into the pathophysiology of crawling feelings under the skin. So it's called formication Uh and it feels like ants are crawling on you. And some of your (laughs) listeners are going to be like, oh my God, that's happening to my wife, you know? And it's, inflammation of the nerves the peripheral nerves under the skin and you just have this constant sensation of you know that feeling and so estrogen is really really helpful for that crazy yeah itchy ears itchy ears so that's crawling feelings under the skin so inflammation of the nerves that are the cutaneous nerves of the skin plus dry skin Hmm. What we lose our oil production because our androgen levels decline. So you have dry and itchy and you have an ear canal where you can't scratch. Mm. And so it drives people crazy and it's highly innervated. And so I tell patients, I give them vaginal estrogen prescription. And if it's bothering the hell out of them, I tell them just take a little bit on a Q-tip, get it in that ear canal two to three times a week and it'll probably go away. Does it work? Yeah. Cool. Works great. Very cool. Um, Steroids will work too, but that's not treating the root cause. So... Frozen shoulder is a big one. So I yeah. know you, it's, it's been talked about a lot. Study about, out of Duke. Yeah, and a lot of uh, on the musculoskeletal syndrome of mm-hmm. menopause. But frozen shoulder is one that I think a lot of people still don't know about. Frozen shoulder is layman's term for something called adhesive capsulitis. And I learned about that one from the internet. And so many people asked me about it. And I decided, okay, let me start digging. And this is before I met Vonda Wright, who is the goddess of all mm-hmm. things menopause and musculoskeletal syndrome. But... I found a study out of Duke University where, I, and if I, I hope I get the details right, but it was the head of the ob department, female, and the head of the female head of the orthopedic surgery department were like sitting at lunch one day and saying, look at all these patients who have frozen shoulder and are, are menopausal, and let's do a study. And they pulled all this, re- you know, pulled data, looked at charts and said, wow, women are much less likely to develop frozen shoulder in menopause if they're on HRT. Wild. They could not get, an orthopedic journal to publish it. It was a beautiful study, like like chef's kiss data. And they got the Menopause Society to publish it. This is another way bias hurts us, you know, because they didn't think it was Well, like, 93% of orthopedic surgeons are men. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's a shame. You did mention the resistant facial hair earlier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why, why is that from androgens? Yeah, oh, we yeah. think it's from androgens. So yeah. one of the caveats of, you know, 
when our estrogen levels decline, our sex hormone binding globulin. So I call it the car that the sex hormones ride in in the bloodstream. And when they're inside of the car, they're not active. And so when they're, then they jump out of the car and they float around the bloodstream, they're active, they bind to receptors and do their job. So why some women have increasing facial hair, increasing acne, increasing body odor, weird smells, you know, are probably because of this, their androgen levels are, are not really rising, but the activity of the androgens are because their estrogen levels is, have declined and estrogen stimulates the liver to create the hormone binding globulins. So those binding globulins, so the activity and the, the free levels of the androgens go up. Freely. Those women tend yeah, sorry, to not one, yeah. have a low testosterone driven libido issue. Right. But the trade-off is they have facial hair and you know, a mustache and acne and they're not happy. Does that mean so, they don't need androgen supplementation? So it, not necessarily. I always warn patients, you know, I'm on testosterone and so I have to do more surveillance for my little chin hair, little Fred, you know, he pops <laughs> up right here every time and I have tweezers in every, you know, bag. I keep tweezers in every bag because, you know, all of a sudden I'll be in a meeting and I'll feel him and then I'm like, I can't stop touching it, right? <laughs> so, but luckily for me, it's not been a huge cosmetic burden mm-hmm. and the acne has been really easy to control. I started testosterone therapy and I did not think I had a libido issue. Everyone was happy at my house. No one complained. Okay. So I was like, I I got lucky Mm because it's so frequent and common. And then I started testosterone therapy because I have sarcopenia. I have very low muscle mass. It's genetic for my age. And I know that this is what's going to keep me out of the nursing home as I get older. So I need to build muscle and I'm eating the protein, I'm the creatine, I'm doing all the things, but this is one more tool in my toolkit, right? Mm-hmm. So I start the testosterone and there's a definite uptick in the levito area and everyone's happier at my house and I would miss it <laughs> if it was gone. Like I yeah. didn't think it was a problem. So I wasn't treating that, which is fine. I treat patients every day with it, but yeah. So I always warn patients about, we're going to add this. I'm also usually putting them on estrogen as well, which is going to kick up their binding globulin. Right. So, right. So yeah. it's probably, yeah, no, I think a lot of women don't know how valuable testosterone is in their bodies for... It's a human hormone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it helps not only with just libido, as you mentioned, it helps with bone health, it helps with muscle mass, and those are really important components as we age. Right, and so what, another thing I want your listeners to take away from this is that women do live longer than men, but we are spending much more time in nursing homes and dealing with frailty and cognitive defects. So when my patients are coming in, they're coming in for acute problems, right? The hot flashes, the night sweats, the libido, the things that are affecting relationships. And we get that taken care of right away. Mm -hmm. And then we start plotting out the next 30 years. What can we do not only with hormone therapy, but because I have a background in nutrition, I'm doing nutritional counseling, I'm measuring their muscle mass and their body fat and their visceral fat, you know, and so I'm, I'm helping them develop a program that they can stick to, hopefully, that is going to keep their bones and muscles strong, their brain strong, their heart strong, you know, because they're not they're looking at their mothers usually and saying, okay, okay, the hot flashes are gone, I'm good. But now I don't want to end up like mom, yeah. who needed 10 years of long term care which is we're three times more likely to end up in a long-term care facility than our male counterpart. So we're living longer, but our health span is terrible. And that's not what we want. You know, we didn't talk about using hormone therapy for prevention. So you've talked about it in your book, but there's so there's some value in terms yes. of cardiovascular prevention. And it, but it's a time-limited window, mm-hmm. right, of that benefit to start. Right, not so in stopping. the first... 10 ish years. Yes. Right, after you, menopause. if you start hormone therapy within the first 10 years of your menopause or before the age of 60, you will have at least a 50% decreased risk of cardiovascular disease and death from cardiovascular disease per year. That's really impressive. Yeah. But we lose that benefit the longer your body's away from estrogen. So if you're starting pure, say you don't, you're the lucky few that doesn't get any hot flashes or other really bothersome symptoms Mm -hmm. and you're starting for prevention, how do you determine a dose? A dose? We don't know. And so that's a good point. Um, The studies that were done, like the best cardiovascular data to date comes from the WHI. I don't want to totally demonize. It's just data. Yeah. Okay. So everything I know about frailty and protein intake comes from, well, Gabrielle Lyon and the WHI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything that I preach about cardiovascular protection prevention comes from the WHI data. And that was Premarin. I don't use Premarin. I use estradiol. Mm-hmm. So we need more studies in this area. So I, you know, I want to be clear about that. Currently, the FDA is not, and the U.S. Preventive Task Force 
which I think is a huge mistake, is not recommending, even though the data is clear and that was published by the American Heart Association, that estrogen is protective, more protective than a statin for the prevention of a primary heart attack in women. Everyone should and be And women are being denied HRT because they have high cholesterol. When it's crazy. It's crazy. So what dose? We don't know. All we know is she was on it or she wasn't. No one checked levels. So we don't have that data. So that's what I tell patients. I don't know what the sweet spot is for cardiovascular disease. All I know is that people took it. I kind of go, let's start in the middle. You know, <laughs> it's based on your age. The higher we go with estrogen, the more likely you are to have breakthrough bleeding if you have a uterus. The lower we go, you know, so so it's kind of a dance. And I say, we have to be patient because we need a lot more studies. But I'm, you know, are you going to do this with me? Because yeah. we're just going to, it's a little bit of experimentation and we don't know. What about starting it after that 10 years is up? For- so it's not, yeah. So she comes in, she's 62, right? And she's, if she's symptomatic, to me, it's a no-brainer. You know, we immediately begin the discussion. But say she's, her symptoms are gone and she has no symptoms. Could this help me? And what I tell her is, it is always going to protect your bones, 100%. It is always going to protect your genital urinary system, especially mm-hmm. vaginal, okay? It's always going to have some protection in other areas, your skin and other areas of your body. Will it protect your heart? We don't know. We start losing that benefit after 10 years. So what we don't want to do is put estrogen on top of cardiovascular disease in the form of atherosclerosis. So we look at cholesterol. We look at the risk factors. If she has no risk factors, I'm like, okay, let's try it. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go low dose. For, For her, I'm going low. If she has elevated cholesterol or some risk factors, I'm sending her for a calcium cardiac score. Mm which is a CT of the heart where they look for calcifications in the coronary arteries. And if that is high risk, then she's probably not going to be a great candidate. That's really helpful. 